Um, so let's go ahead and call the meeting to order. And if you would, please go ahead and do the roll call. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending today's meeting. If you could, if you're on the phone, you may be muted. Um, so please hit star six to unmute yourself and then star six to mute yourself back if you want to do that. Otherwise, just use your phone to mute capability. Um, I'm going to start with Alan Shute. Is Alan on? Or you may need to unmute yourself on a computer as well if you're using a computer. Um, Aim Barnett. Aim Barnett. Ayanna Howard. Present. Thank you. Bart Gobiel. Bart Gobiel. Ben Copeland. Present. Thank you. Governor Kemp. Governor Kemp. Uh, Buddy Hardin. Here. Thank you. Kayana Good. Present. Thank you. Cares Acree. Present. Thank you. Chris Tobiasen. Present. Thank you. Chris Wells. Chris Wells. Chuck Little. Yeah, here. Thank you. Del Key. Del Key. <laughs> Eric Hughes. Eric Hughes, Evelyn Olenek. Present. Thank you. Frank Ginn. Frank Ginn. Chunk Newman. I'm present. Thank you. Greg Dozier. Present. Thank you. James Wilburn. Present. Thank you. Jay Cunningham. Jay Cunningham. Gerald Mitchell. Gerald Mitchell. Joe Yarborough. Present. Thank you. Karen Vieira. Present. Thank you. Kelly Brownlow. Present. Thank you. Kevin Jackson Jr. <clears throat> Kevin Jackson Jr. Marsha Dixon. Present. Thank you. Mark Butler. State workforce. He's in the meeting. They're doing. Mark Butler. Mark Wilson. Present. Sounds good. Thank you. Mike Long. President and accounted for. Thank you. <laughs> Mike Roby. Mike Roby. Phil Sutton. Phil Sutton. Randy Beal. Randy Beal. Randy Tom, Randy Tom, Robin Crintenden, present. Thank you, Sam Dasher, Sam Dasher, Stuart Countess, present. Thank you. Susan Andrews. Here. Thank you. Teresa Fisher. Here. Thank you. Tom Cook. Here. Thank you. Tyrone Oliver. Tyrone Oliver. Wendell Dallas. Present. 
Thank you. I'll go through the list one more time. Alan Schutz. Alan Schutz. Ames Barnett. Ames Barnett. Bart Gobeil. Chris Wells. Del Key. Eric Hughes, Frank Ginn. I'm trying to find a place to put this computer where the light is better. Teresa, you're you're unmuted. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Jay Cunningham, Gerald Mitchell. Kevin Jackson Jr., Mark Butler, Mike Roby, Phil Sutton, Randy Beal, Randy Tom, and Sam Dasher. I'd like to point out, Mr. Chair, that we have 100% attendance from all of our women board members. <laughs> oh, man. That's great. <laughs> right. so we have more. On behalf okay. of the we, <laughs> we do have four, Mr. Chairman. Okay, and I think on Alan, I think Alan looks like they're muted. I'm not sure if that's the same Alan C, or is that a different Alan? Alan C. Oh, no, Alan Shoots starts with an S. Oh, yes. Oh, Shoots. Okay, I'm sorry. My bad. All right. Well, very good. So we're, we're at a quorum. Thank you very much, Nia, Kristen, and for the added commentary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, uh, I just want, want to welcome everybody to the, the board meeting to, today. Um, I, as I reflect on this year, and many of us were talking before we started the meeting today, and many of us have talked several times uh, throughout these past few months. We've had several meetings under these circumstances, and I just want to uh, tell you thank you very much for your continued support, your hard work, and um, really focusing on the uh, the citizens here in Georgia. Um, this the the individuals working in this space, the local area especially. I really want to thank them for their commitment to figuring out ways to serve um, individuals who need help or assistance. And I think all, you know, one of the, the best things we can do is be who we are. Uh, George has always been committed to supporting and helping and taking care of each other. And I just want you to know that uh, uh, it's, a, it's always an honor to be able to represent the state, to be able to represent this board and the hardworking folks that are committed to this each and every day. So thank you. I mean, I, I know it, we all wish we were already uh, past this uh, pandemic. Um, the, obviously, in the, the news lately, there's been some very encouraging um, announcements associated with vaccines and what that could mean for us going forward. We continue to pay very close attention to the economy. Uh, folks are still uh, relying on assistance um, for their various means. And so um, there's just a lot of moving parts right now. And I'm positive that all of us are um, probably probably burned out is probably the, the better word to use to describe this in terms of being on phone calls or Zoom calls or video conferencing all day long. And uh, if you're like me, uh, when we first, uh, back in March, when we started shutting everything down in terms of not meeting face-to-face, um, all of a sudden, um, I wake up and it's November and it's Thanksgiving next week. And I'm like going, what in the world happened to the year? Uh, it's like a blur. I just did not. It was going as slow as molasses that all of a sudden uh, it's a lightning bolt. And so um, I'm sure all of us have gone through these ups and downs. Uh, we miss uh, being with our friends and family on a regular basis. We miss doing some of the things that we normally do to recharge um, but I just want to, I want you to, to know that uh, I appreciate your commitment. Um, we, we're all in this together. We will continue supporting each other. Um, I want to thank the team that's been uh, coordinating all this for us because they've had to transition from taking care of um, uh, setting accommodations for us uh, physically, the logistics and the venues, 
um, and the coordination with the local areas. And, and now we've had to move to a virtual world and they've done a great job. We've gone through some learning pains. Uh, the key thing is we've gotten better every time and I could not be more proud of the team. So folks, thank you all for being here this morning. Um, we've got a, a very nice meeting put together. There's some good information that will be shared today. Um, something for us to all be proud of. And as we go into 21, I'm excited because the future does look bright for us. To, uh, I think we are going to be at some point getting back together. Um, and I just feel it. Uh, I believe it. And um, I know that we're going to do everything we possibly can to do that. So thanks again. So um, we'll just jump right into business. Uh, so everyone should have received the information uh, that was emailed out by our manager, uh, Nia. Um, and so what I do need is uh, the agenda is out there. So could I have a, do I have a motion to approve the agenda? This is Evelyn Olenek, motion so approved. All right, great move, motion. I'll second. Kelly, okay. All right, Nia, did you get that? I did. All right, any questions or discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Uh, Aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? All right. Motion carries. Thank you very much. We also received the minutes from our last board meeting, um, August 13th. Um, so do we have a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve, Susan. Thank you, Commissioner. Second, this is Robin Crittenden. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> All right, uh, any questions or discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All right, any opposed? Motion carries, thank you very much. We're gonna jump right into our committee reports. First up, we have uh, Karen Vieira. Uh, Karen is the Chief People Officer of Church's Chicken. Karen, the floor is yours, ma'am. Thank you. So we had a meeting on November 12th, our committee meeting at two o'clock in the afternoon. We did have quorum, but we didn't have any motions to approve for the floor. So we took an opportunity just to connect as uh, committee members on what was happening in our various companies and, and what we were experiencing about potential return to the workplace, uh, which was a nice little opportunity. So several, most of our manufacturers, as you know, have not closed their doors and their offices are open and they're working as, as usual. Uh, there are a few folks that are, are deciding what to, when to return to the office and potentially considering a, sta a staggered schedule in January. Uh, Tom Cook, who's on our committee, he mentioned that he's been, his, he and his company have been working remotely since April, and then they're taking a look at terminating the office lease. So I know some companies are in the process of downsizing or reducing office space. So it's kind of interesting to see what's happening out there in the workforce. So it just gave us an opportunity to connect as a team. Um, then we went into our, our updates and we had a Brett Lacey, Director of Work Source Fulton County, share with us some of the highlights with his group. Their office is closed on March 15th. Um, they have not reopened at this time and don't have an exact date of when they're going to reopen. So what, what he was sharing with us is the regional website, AtlantaWorks.org was created to allow potential and existing participants to receive services online. And they also created an online application that will help job seekers navigate that enrollment process. Uh, Brett mentioned the effort that the region has made on social media. They're on LinkedIn, they're, they're trying to connect with businesses and let the businesses know about the workforce system. Uh, one of the biggest challenges has been high-speed internet access, and so they're preparing to make their mobile unit available to participants across um, the North Georgia area. They're working with Goodwill to provide a digital literacy to Fulton County residents, so that, that's in process right now. 
Then we moved over to Shamika Johnson, who is our TCSG Office of Workforce Development Communications Director. And she and her team have been out there offering training in response to the COVID pandemic. They're doing um, live walkthroughs on tools that can be used for communication to help the team to alleviate some of the stress related to social media graphic design and other challenges. Um, they, so they're, they're maintaining um, the, the newsletter and they got that out to everyone. So things are going well and they're adjusting and they're flexing to the needs uh, of their, the folks that they support. Then we moved over to share some monitoring updates. Brittany Singer, our compliance director, normally they're out in the field, they're meeting with, with the, the, the offices across the state and obviously that is a problem for social distancing. They normally sit in a conference room and they do their audit process, but they have not been able to, out of respect for those folks and out of uh, wanting to maintain the social distancing and safety, they're doing the auditing online and they will conclude on schedule on March 2021. So again, uh, the teams are adjusting, um, they're, they're keeping the work moving, they're continuing to connect with people in the community that need the services or continuing to run their, their areas of the uh, OWD offices through flexing. Um, so it was nice to hear what's going on and, and really appreciate the committee. We did have quorum, but like I said, we had no motions to approve. So great conversation and thanks to everyone that participated. And I'll turn it back to you if there's no questions. Well, Karen, thank you very much for the update. Um, so I will open up to the board. Does the, any of the board members have questions for Karen and the Dal Dalton Dislocated Worker Committee? Very good. Thank you all very much. Karen, thank you again for what you and your, your committee, your team's doing. Um, and I'll just, as folks, if you heard her go down the list of things, um, there's a, uh, we're obviously we're, we're moving into a, a new way of uh, uh, doing business. It's impacting everything. And I'm, I think all of us would pay close attention to what the world looks like in 2021 and beyond. Uh, folks are making some big decisions, uh, but we all also know that um, uh, many folks can't wait to get back to what their what their normal is. So a lot more to come in this area, and I appreciate y'all staying focused on and committed and have an understanding of what's taking place here in Georgia. So thanks again, Karen. Thank you. Thanks to the committee. So we'll move on to the youth committee. Uh, I'll now turn it over to uh, our the vice chair of the Harris County Board of Commissioners. Commissioner Susan Andrews, the floor is yours, ma'am. Thank you so much. It's good to see everybody's faces online this morning. We had our youth committee meeting on November the 10th. We didn't have a quorum on that meeting, but we also had no action items. So we received an update from um, the local workforce development agency nine, district nine, and that's in the Athens area. Carol Rayburn Cooper and Rima Sullivan, who is the youth manager, provided that update for us. <clears throat> so they presented the uh, partnerships and grants, the COVID-19 challenges. Today, we always have to talk about those challenges, the youth work experiences, and they shared some success stories with us. Northeast Georgia's youth provider is Action Inc and they have one career coach per county, and each coach is working with approximately 10 to 12 high school students. And they are also working to provide their in-school youth with summer work experiences, even in the middle of the pandemic. Hopefully we'll be able to get back out there and uh, put those students in a work environment next summer. Action Inc, Bridges to Success, and Paxson, Eckerd Connects or Northeast Out of School Youth Providers, and they focus on GED instruction and work experience. They shared um, unique work experience. You know, when we think about jobs, sometimes there are some that never cross many of our minds. And there was a young person who wanted to be a funeral director and work as a mortician. And so they provided the opportunity for that young person to get into 
a funeral parlor and men, be mentored. And um, so that was just one of their success uh, cases that they talked to us about. And it just kind of out of the box thinking for them to meet the needs and interest of a wide variety of children. They work closely with partners like Boys and Girls Club and the libraries to enable some summer work experiences. Northeast also provides individual training accounts to youths age 18 to 24, and it's up to $7,500, and um, they can use that for books, tuition, and supplies. However, because of funding cuts, that's been a challenge for them to continue to maintain that. They've experienced a 14% decrease on top of a 9% decrease from the previous year, but they are still trying to maintain those funding accounts and training accounts for those young people. The summer Northeast Georgia this past summer was unable to run, of course, their high school summer experiences, but now they're working on virtual work experiences and that's just part of the real world as we all know it. And they have um, many young people engaged in that. They have to have a 75 percent GPA, good attendance, and enrolled in the in-school youth program for at least three months to participate in those online work experiences. And lastly, a few of their, their success stories. There was a, a low-income youth who recently completed his master's degree at Kennesaw State, and they had seen that young person through um, all of his education, and they were very proud of that particular case and a recent high school student who had a slight learning disability. So it was difficult for him to um, manage, uh, I'm sure his school environment, and yet they assisted him in getting a job at Caterpillar where he's making $17.85 an hour directly out of high school. So that was two, those were two of their uh, success stories they shared with us. Ben Lanier then shared with us that he is working with all of the um, local areas to be able to provide TABE testing virtually. He's training them individually and he's thankful that TCSG is allowing us to work with them during that process. And so participants now have the ability to take TABE virtually in light of all of the COVID-19 restrictions. So again, thank you to the staff for all your diligence, to the youth committee for um, joining us on that day and chairman we have no action items to bring to the full board but if there are any questions i'll be glad to entertain them thank you commissioner andrews so uh board are any questions for commissioner andrews or in and youth committee quiet group today okay uh, wonderful wonderful update commissioner um uh, always always a pleasure um, and, and especially this being our, our feeder system in the truest sense uh, to the future of Georgia. And uh, uh, shout out to Carol and um, uh, Rayma, the, uh, their work in the area. I know that's we spotlighted them this month and uh, I, I've not had a chance to visit uh, with the GWLA uh, because of the, the obviously the COVID and everything else that we're trying to coordinate all these things. But uh, nice report out. I know folks are really working hard in this space and we could not be more proud of the effort that everyone's put into this. So thank you again. All right, next up, we have the Performance and Accountability Committee. Uh, Dr. James Wilburn, he's a director for Military Academic Province Programs for Georgia Tech Professional Education. Uh, Dr. Wilburn, I'll turn the floor over to you, sir. Great, good morning, everyone. Uh, on Tuesday, November 10th at 2 p.m., the Performance and Accountability Committee uh, meeting was held. We did have a quorum. Brittany Singer discussed the final non-discrimination plan, which will be presented to the full board later in this meeting, so no actions required at this point. Uh, Brittany also discussed the updates for the local regional plans. The local areas originally submitted their draft local plans back in June and later received required revisions and additions. The LWDAs have now resubmitted their plans with those edits. All plans have been approved with the exception of two, and by the next board meeting, the final two areas should have their plans approved by their boards and closed out. Steve Wilson discussed PY19 performance outcomes. Uh, PY19 was a great year. 
uh, for overall performance. And without stealing too much of Steve's uh, thunder, because he's going to talk a little bit more of a comprehensive uh, review of the performance later on in this meeting. But uh, an example is our second quarter performance rate measure goal was 77% for adult, but the actual rate was 86.7%, which is 112.6% of our goal. As long as we are at 90% uh, or above, we are good. Uh, for adults, we were at 138.9% across all measures. And for dislocated workers, we averaged out at 130.5% for all measures. Then for youth, we were at a 116.7% average across the measures. So for the first time since moving to the WIOA measures, the credential attainment measure was above that 90% threshold. So again, Stephen's gonna cover this, but absolutely outstanding news for our performance for 2019. And don't we all need some great news as we finish up 2020? So uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chairman, unless there's any specific questions for the committee. Thank you, Dr. Wilburn. Um, are there, if there are any questions, I'm, I think I'm actually trying to pay attention to if anyone raises their hand. So. If I see a hand, if, I, if it's a number, I may not know who you are. I may ask you to identify yourself, but if there are, let us know. All right, Dr. Wilburn, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate what you're doing, uh, working on the committee, the Forest Accountability Committee. Uh, great work, and to your point, great numbers. I know we'll hear a little bit more here in just a little bit as well from Steve. All right, uh, next up is the Financial uh, Oversight Committee. Uh, typically have uh, my buddy, uh, Mayor uh, Ames uh, Barnett, uh, but I'm not sure he's on today. And so with that, I think we're going to have, is it Serena that's going to do the update? Good morning, on... sir. Yes. <laughs> the floor is yours, Serena. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning to Chairman Dallas and the members of the board. Again, I have just a brief update on behalf of Mr. Ames Barnett, and I will uh, take this moment also to say that I did hear from him via email earlier this week, and he is resting, and his his thoughts and energies are with the board, and he wants to know what he can do. Uh, and uh, I took the liberty of saying that what he can do is get better and, and get back to us. So um, with that, I have just a few uh, updates for you. We did not have an, an active meeting this month, um, and we also didn't have any action items. So uh you know this is just sort of pro forma for your information the COVID-19 grant and funding i think is the, the the big uh good elephant in the room right now for finance and for the office of workforce development we have received a second round of funding bringing our total funding to uh right at or around 25 million dollars and that money has been dispersed to the local areas and is being used primarily in three kind of broad categories, employment and training being one, sanitation of schools being another, and sanitation of public facilities being uh, the third. And you know, that it's as um, everything else is going in 2020 is being used to fill in gaps where those gaps exist and to find innovative ways of meeting uh, workforce needs for uh, the citizens of Georgia. So that'll be an ongoing story and uh, the office will have more updates for you as, as programs and uh, performance unfolds in, in that way. The second update that I have is with regard to uh, fiscal year 21 funding. And again, with everything else, as long as um, things are normal in the world of finance, then we smile and we nod and we're grateful for it. So um, we received the FY21 funding. We dispersed those contracts and awards as well and uh, local areas have begun uh, giving us those contracts back to execute and have been making quick use of that money. Everybody was kind of uh, anxious and grateful uh, to receive it uh, in, at the state level as well as the local level. So uh, that's another uh, good check mark on our list. And then finally, uh, oh, we completed the, the closeout processes for funding that ended for the local areas on June 30th of 2020. And, uh, you know, just as a reminder, when um, funding ends at the two-year period for the local level is brought back up to the state level for one additional year to be used before, to be used or lost if, if we don't use it. 
um, and the good news is, and you know, we, we're always happy about this, the amount that was brought back up to the state level this year was $177,072. And as a reference for you, that amount last year was $539,214. So uh, $539,214. So even uh, in the midst of a pandemic and the slowing or shifting of work processes, the local areas were very good and very diligent about making use of the monies and putting uh, good use to the funding that we were receiving. So uh, kudos to them as well. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much, Serena. Great update. Um, a lot of moving parts there, but all seem to be things that are going the right direction for us. So I appreciate us executing well around that, um, especially administering funds. Uh, any questions for Serena and the Financial Oversight Committee? Okay, hearing none, thank you very much, Serena, again. All right, next up, uh, from the Executive Committee standpoint, uh, as you see on the, uh, I'm looking at the screen, and was also submitted in the packet that went out prior to this meeting, uh, we have a list of the uh, State Workforce Development Board meeting dates for 2021. And so I'll just give folks a second to look at that. And so what I'll need uh, for the floor is a motion to approve the meeting dates for 2021. Motion to approve, this is Karen Vieira. Thank you. Second, Ben Copeland. Uh, ben, thank you, sir. All right, uh, any questions or discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Likes on. All right, motion carries. Thank you very much. And as we can appreciate, uh, um, we can definitely count on the February meeting uh, being a virtual meeting again. Um, and the, the thing I'll say is that uh, we'll continue to pay attention to what is available, what, what our options are. And uh, I can assure you folks are anxious to get together. So I think as soon as that is safe to do, we will. But for now, uh, for the foreseeable future, I plan on all of our meetings still being virtual. So, and I, I just want to thank uh, Nia and Kristen and the entire team uh, for their work in making to keeping all this going and making this as smooth as possible for all of us. So thank you all. Um, the other thing I'd, I'd announce, um, I'd like to announce in this, um, uh, in this update is that uh, the appointment of uh, Tyrone Oliver, he's uh, the commissioner of Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice. And so we welcome Commissioner Oliver to the State Workforce Development Board. So um, as you can tell, the Obviously, the governor and the governor's office is extremely busy during this time, but as we continue to uh, stay focused on serving the state, uh, we'll ha having new members appointed. And as you look at our committee structure, we'll continue to work on that as well. But folks, I'll, I'll just tell you, thank you for your commitment to, uh, to serving Georgia. Um, and thank you for uh, continuing to stay engaged and providing your leadership and support. Um, and especially in today's, in today's environment, it's extremely critical and I know we all look forward and we'll be on the other side of the pandemic, but during the pandemic, we're working extremely hard and the committee structure is the way we get the work done here. So thank you. <clears throat> so are there any uh, questions uh, for any of the committee members, myself, before we go on to the next item? Trying to look at faces. Okay, everything looks good. All right, excellent. All right, so we'll move right on uh, to the uh, next item on the agenda. Uh, the non-discrimination non plan, uh, Brittany Singer, I think you're gonna handle this for us. So Brittany, I will turn it over to you. Brittany Yell's mic's muted. I was gonna say, is Brittany, is Brittany on? Oh, yep, oh, here we go. Sorry, we unmuted on the phone and not on the computer. 
Um, so I'll, I'll just repeat <laughs> that quick bit. So you all might recall that we um, discussed updates to the non-discrimination plan back in August. Um, but just as a reminder, the plan is the piece of our work that describes the state's actions to ensure that the equal opportunity and non-discrimination portions of WIOA are met in our services. Um, and that plan must undergo a review every two years. So earlier this year, we did some minor grammatical updates. We also made sure that the list of the local equal opportunity officers was updated, um, you know, to reflect some staff changes there. We submitted those updates to the U.S. Department of Labor's Civil Rights Center back in June. Um, we've not heard any feedback from them or received any edits, so we are ready to put the, the plan up for a, a vote before you all. Um, and our plan is officially due to the CRC in December, and then should this be approved, we'll submit the verification of this vote to them as the final piece, and we'll be, we'll be good to go for this round of review. Um, I'm happy to take any questions, but if there are none, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Brittany, thank you very much. So do we need to <clears throat> vote on those those changes? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So do we uh, do I have a motion to uh, to approve? This is Chris Tobias saying to make a motion. Thank you. Oh, Cook a second. Thank you. All right. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Any questions or discussion? Okay, uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed like sign? Motion carries. All right, well, Brittany, uh, thank you very much. And I know you were the third person in the room. I, I, when I think you took your mask off early and I could not see you. Uh, I'm looking at the small screen, so thanks. I know you, Nia, and Kristen are all there together, so uh, we appreciate the update. Next up, we have the Apprenticeship State Expansion Grant. This will be handled by Jamie Jordan. Jamie, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we wanted to provide you all with um, it's an exciting update, but one that has been a long time in the making for our second, and I'll talk about the other one in just a minute. Our second office is an apprenticeship grant. So we actually, this is a unique situation to where actually last summer, uh, after we had applied for this grant, the U.S. Department of Labor came back and said, we've approved you to be awarded this grant, but in reality, we haven't actually read or approved your application yet. We will have to go through a compliance review to see if what you propose is actually allowed under the grant, um, but just be excited that you've gotten the money. And so we've kind of been in this holding pattern actually for a year and a half now, waiting for the results of that compliance review to see if what we actually propose in our application was an allowable use of those funds. And we have finally in the last month, a month and a half, received that programmatic approval to, to get the green light on this grant. And so we're excited to be working with our apprenticeship team to finally be moving the implementation of this grant forward. Uh, so wanted to update the board to let you know that we are now in the phase of implementation for this grant. Uh, unfortunately, with that delay of the compliance review, we have unfortunately lost a year and a half of the, 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 the grant period on this grant. But we feel confident we can still utilize this grant fully and accomplish the, the stated goals of the grant application. Uh, so as you'll see on the screen, these are just kind of the basic high level overviews of, of how this grant will work. And I'll contrast that with the existing grant we have, the AAI grant on the next slide. But as you'll see on this slide, so we, we are having to meet the requirements of this grant. Uh, we have got to fund 800 new apprentices. Uh, this is actually, it was mandated in the grant application that the number for the amount that, that we received as a state, which was set by population, uh, hit at least 800. And you'll know this is actually a big jump um, from our, our previous grant. And it's one that we think is ambitious, but we do believe we can hit the number. Um, but that is why you'll see the difference between this grant and the next one um, is you'll see there's caps on how much we can, you know, we can reimburse per apprentice. And the reason for that is that 800 apprentices number that we have to hit. So based on what our award for the grant was and us having to meet that 800 number, that is where we came down to where the max we can reimburse for this grant is $1,300 per apprentice. Uh, the way that's gonna be divided, which is a little bit different from our existing grant, is it's kind of split up in that 1,300 per apprentice uh, in that $1,000 of it can go toward the employer as reimbursement to recoup some of the costs associated uh, with their, their apprenticeship. Uh, so that can be anything from the tuition that they're paying for the RTI or the related technical instruction side of it, 
any tools or, or, or books or, or any other equipment that may be needed. But the important piece of this, and this is where we, we were going back and forth on the negotiation, is it all has to be tied to apprentice related costs. So the employer itself, if they're buying machinery or equipment for the employer, uh, this can be used to reimburse that, but it can be used to reimburse any direct apprentice related cost to the employer. Now the other 300 pieces for the organization serving as the sponsor on the apprenticeship, and this is for that sponsor to be able to recoup some of those costs in terms of time and effort, uh, in terms of any types of basic office supplies or other supplies needed to support the apprentice um, as they're working as the sponsor to fill out all the paperwork and, and work with our office and work with the, the Office of Apprenticeship. Uh, this can also, if the sponsor chooses to, can also be used to go toward direct apprentice costs as well. Um, as I said on the first one, both of these will be reimbursement based. So we will have a form that they will submit to show the, the costs they've incurred for us to reimburse. That was a mandated form. We wanted this to kind of be an incentive payment. Uh, the, the feds would not uh, approve that structure. So this is now the way this will have to be structured as a, a reimbursement. So if you have an employer that is serving as the sponsor themselves, they will be eligible for up to $1,300 per apprentice. Now that is for the life of the apprentice. So it's not a, like a per year situation. It will be $1,300 per apprentice for the duration of the grant. And that's what we'll have to track closely to make sure you know we don't pay more than that out per apprentice. Uh, but they will be allowed to, to reimburse for up to $1,300. And you'll see that then that that's the case if you have someone that's, you have an organization that's serving as both the employer and the sponsor. And you can go to the next screen. Next slide, excuse me. So this will show you kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of our two apprenticeship grants as they stand right now. Uh, you'll see the first the one we've had for a little while now is the AAI grant, and that expires in September of next year, September 2021. And that was pretty straightforward. It is an H-1B funded grant so that it, it only serves and, and supports occupations and H-1B eligible industries. And so you'll see that that is the same way, but it's reimbursement really for the cost of tuition and anything associated with the RTI side of the house. So these are payments that are going directly to our colleges based on how the grant was, the grant was originally structured and there's no cap. So we can pay on the RTI side, there's no cap per apprentice of how much we can pay and reimburse in that regard. Uh, so we do still have funds you know, remaining in that grant. So if that is something that you or local area is interested in, we are still working through September of 2021 to expend those grant funds. And then this new grant will, will run until June of 2022. And that's what I was just talking, you'll see there of how it's a little bit different because this one can also be paid to, to the companies. We do, do still have a feeling that for the companies that are working with our colleges or with another outside training provider for their RTI, that it will probably be easier for us to just cut that check directly to the training provider instead of them paying and get reimbursed. And that is something we can do. Uh, but again, it will be that $1,300 per apprentice. And that is going to be the major difference between these two grants. Are there any questions on these two grants, how we are trying to implement them and operationalize them? I'm looking, Jamie. I don't see any questions coming up. Okay. And if you'll go to the next slide, uh, and then you'll see here, these are the, the everyone on our apprenticeship team. So we are blessed to have a fantastic team there that is working to assist companies across the state to set up new apprenticeships, working with our local areas and our college contacts as we try to build out the infrastructure at the state level to support apprenticeship. So if anyone has questions or need assistance, or if you or your company or you know a company that is interested in trying to tap into apprenticeship overall or one or two of these grants, uh, feel free to reach out to any of the, the people you see on the screen here on our team. Uh, they stand willing and ready to help any way they can. And if there are Jamie, no questions. This is yeah. Jamie Chuck Little here. I, I'm just curious, in the last 12 months, how many reg new registered apprenticeship programs have, has TCSG brought in? And we, if Holly was on today, she could answer that question. As you can imagine, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, things did slow down pretty significantly. But we were su surprised to find that it actually ticked back up pretty quickly. So Holly and her team, after starting about late April, May, I mean, things started to pick back up for them pretty quickly. And they have been working pretty steadily to get new programs set up. Uh, now, oftentimes, the number itself of you'll see like new registered apprenticeship may not reflect the level of work they're actually doing because they may work six months, as you know, Chuck, when you're standing up a brand new program, there's a lot of, of groundwork that has to be laid to get that off the ground. So I know they've been working a lot over the last few months to help a lot of new companies who are just, this is their first foray into apprenticeship to work through the curriculum development side to get set up on RTI. Uh, so I know there's been a lot of work put in there that you may not see yet in terms of new registered apprentices through USDOL system. Um, but I can, we can definitely get those numbers and send that out to the board. 
Yeah, it would be nice to see a dashboard of, you know, how many programs every six months, how many new programs, how many new apprentices, you know, just, just those kinds of things. Yeah. We are working now and within our internally for us, especially on this new grant, uh, to build in. So the portal that we use to track participants for our WIOA network, we're trying to build in to be able to track our apprentices, even those that are non-WIOA apprentices, so that we have a solid database that we can compare and contrast that data in terms of growth. Uh, so we're working on that now and we're mandated to as part of this grant. And that'll allow us to more easily pull some of these reports. Because right now we're kind of at the will, at the whim, excuse me, of the Office of Apprenticeship with USDOL. We go, we work through their, their system, which is called Rapids that you know, Chuck. And so we kind of have to ask for them to pull these reports and show us. Because as you know, even though our office is the state's apprenticeship office for working to set it up, we don't have access to the apprentice data that we are not directly attached to. And so we can't really give you an accurate picture statewide of those non-TCSG attached apprentices we kind of have to ask and wait for that data from the state and are from the feds, excuse me. And they've gone through some leadership transition in the last few months and it's been, it's been a little bit challenging. So we're hoping to try to get to a better posture where we have more of that data readily available ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? If not, I will turn it back over to you, Chairman. Uh, well, Jamie, thank you very much. Great update. And uh, I will tell you that uh, this is something I also want to pay close attention to as well. Um, at the, um, as many of you know, I'm, I'm on the um, NGA State Board Chairs Association. And this is one of the areas that I, I would like to highlight and us to talk about what's happening in Georgia, because uh, there seems to be a, there's a continued interest in, the, in this space. So great work on this. And I'm looking forward to seeing us continue to, to leverage and utilize these available, these available dollars. So thanks. Thank you. All right, let's uh, move on to the next item. It was the Technical College's response to COVID-19, which we all know that uh, uh, we've all made adjustments. So we'll now have a chance to hear from Dr. Hornsby. Uh, Dr. Hornsby, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. Thank you uh, very much. It is um, good to be with you this morning. I was asked to address how our colleges are handling COVID-19. Um, I thought I would address this topic by explaining what the system and the colleges are doing to, to be as efficient and effective as possible during this challenging time. Uh, when I talk with the colleges, I know um, it's a stressful fall semester. We've never had a fall semester like this before to deal with. And um, they are they're doing their best as as I as I have included on this slide, they they work they're working very diligently to ensure protocols are in place to make sure that our students and employees are safe and feel comfortable either with online instruction or coming on campus. Uh, we. Um, Communication, as I'm sure you know, I mean, it's, it's a challenging time to work with staff. And um, so it's, communication becomes even more important during a time like this. And uh, we have met from the system office, we've met with our presidents, with our vice presidents on a very regular basis, virtually to share plans and learn from each other regarding up regarding things that I'll be talking about today, such as limited lab opportunities for our students. And of course, moving more students online and other COVID-19 related issues. Next screen. Um, we did um, put together, TCSG did a COVID-19 task force, which has been very important and develop guidance for the colleges to ensure that they are meeting Governor Kemp's and the CDC guidelines. Uh, this summer, with the limited labs, students were allowed to finish hands-on programs when they were near graduation. They weren't forced to, but they were definitely allowed to participate in these opportunities, uh, especially if they had some form of hardship. This fall, we continued trying to keep labs smaller, maintaining our social distancing and encouraging students and faculty to wear appropriate 
personal protective equipment. And, and again, uh, cleaning, as you know, but is even more important than you usually. Uh, it's very essential to um, make sure that we clean very thoroughly between classes to make sure we don't have any issues. Next, uh, next screen. I'm very, I'm very proud of the uh, Georgia Virtual Technical Connection during this time. This is our distance education arm and has done just a phenomenal job during this time providing technical assistance and professional development to faculty and staff. For example, this summer, as you can see on screen, they conducted 51 training sessions with over 6,000 attendees. You don't just flip a switch and everything gets taught online. Um, we were already doing a lot of online teaching. However, there were still many faculty members that needed some training on exactly how to do it, how to work with what we call our learning management system and provide those opportunities. Uh, and GVT, as we call them, GVTC has done an excellent job. They developed a dedicated resource page for faculty, for administrators. And then, um, for example, just this summer, 2,462 online courses were scheduled. And this was an increase of over 122% over the summer before. And so our colleges are working very closely, very diligently to make this happen. In post-secondary, it's different than secondary. College, students have choices. So the students can choose whether they want an online opportunity or a more traditional one. And they can still go on campus and have lab opportunities because as you know, not everything can be online. You still have to learn how to fix a car. You still have to learn how to weld. So, but we're just trying to keep those as safe as possible for our students. Uh, next screen, please. I uh, wanted to mention fall enrollment briefly. Um, enrollment in majority online courses is more than 167,000 for fall semester. We were pleased. Um, which is over 60,000 greater than the same enrollment last year. And that's for online. More students are doing online opportunities as we would expect. And uh, this is 65% compared to 36% last fall. And then enrollment in non-online courses is almost 88,000. So, uh, so people are still coming on campus. Some colleges, it's about 50, 50, 50. some it's 75% coming, being online. A lot depends on what part of the state you're in. And again, depends on the kind of programs. Our colleges have done a great job trying to provide opportunities for students, making sure they know what's online and what's not, making sure that, that they know about some of the great opportunities that we've, pr we've developed during this time. One, for example, is our Amazon Web Services program, but we also have a lot of others that were developed during this time. So it hasn't stopped the creativity. So I'm very proud of the good work the colleges are doing. And then um, next screen. So um, as I mentioned before, our colleges have just had to be nimble this fall. Because you never, they have, as we say, we have to pivot. We have to pivot quickly to make sure that everyone's safe on campus and help our students be successful. So as you can see, it's been a busy time, as I know it's been in your world also, as we all adjust to what this, what this new normal is all about. Any questions? Thank you for your time today.
Well, Dr. Hornsby, thank you very much for the update. Um, and we definitely appreciate uh, the fact that our, all of our worlds have changed, uh, not only from the standpoint of just our employees within the organization, but also the, the, the folks we're serving. Um, and, you know, for us in the business world, our customers, uh, even how we interact with them has changed. So we appreciate what, what everyone is doing and the continued focus on the safety of all involved in the process. So uh, thanks. Great update. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So next up, we have the Virtual WorkSource Academy. Um, they're going to get an update uh, from Robin Roberts, Roberts excuse me, on the training session. So Robin, I'm going to turn it over to you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mia, if we could go ahead and move to the next slide. and begin the video. Thank you for joining us for this WorkSource Georgia Academy training session. And we just thought that this was so important, especially right now as things in workforce are continuing to change, to just really take a look at how we view outreach. The purpose of this training is to provide you with an increased awareness on how to serve individuals with disabilities in a remote service delivery environment. All right, well, good morning. And as you know, due to the pandemic, uh, we transitioned this year's WorkSource Georgia Academy Conference to a virtual environment. And I have to give a big shout out again to Andrea Young and the communications team for all of their great work. Uh, we would not have been able to accomplish this transition without them. And speaking of accomplishments, we have already completed six training sessions since September. Uh, we began offering training sessions that were recommended by the Office of Workforce Development Directors. Next slide, please. And hopefully this transit, there we go, good. Uh, I am happy to report that we have had 50 to 70 participants for each session and re we recorded each session for future viewing. Uh, the recordings and additional resources are available on our website and they are organized by the various roles within our workforce system. Next slide, please. Uh, Kim Morris kicked off our virtual training sessions with a pre-recorded presentation on better serving those who served and then followed with a live Q&A session. Next. Michelle Mason and Rosani Rios incorporated several unique icebreakers into their presentation and provided numerous resources on disability awareness. Next. Uh, due to the tremendous interest in the communications team's first presentation on MailChimp basics, we decided to move their next two presentations up on the calendar. The Canva basics training was offered in October, and they just completed the later basics training earlier this week. Next. The business services team provided an outstanding presentation on strategies for economic recovery. Instead of going over the basics of We Owe Business Services at the beginning of their presentation, they decided to offer Business Services 101 uh, a video as a prerequisite. And I am happy to report that Business Services 101 has already received 75 views. Next. And we're not done. We have four more training sessions scheduled through February and we are discussing opportunities for additional training sessions. Uh, I would like to mention that the compliance, finance, and programs teams recorded a two-part presentation on subrecipient monitoring back in May. Uh, those recordings have already received over 100 views, and the team is currently working on plans for a follow-up training session in December that will include live Q&A sessions. Next. And that concludes our presentation on the WorkSource Georgia Academy. Uh, when we do send out the video, we'll send out a link 
to the um, Academy website as well, uh, so that you have a chance to look at the different resources that have been added. Thank you. Robin, thank you very much. And um, I, I know folks are looking at the, we're gonna definitely get that information out. Uh, one question was brought up about, can we drop that into the chat area as well? So Kristen, if y'all are able to do that, great. If not, obviously we'd understand, but uh, I know that's uh, how a lot, <laughs> leveraging the technology we have available to us, a lot of folks do that through the chat now too as well. So, all right, Robin, thanks again. You're welcome. All right, we're going to move on to the next item on the National Dislocated Worker Grant Updates. So, uh, uh, Brittany, oh, there's a, a whole host of folks here. Uh, Brittany Bullock, uh, uh, Leslie Lambert, and then also Carol Rayburn Kofer. All right, so I will turn it over to Brittany. I guess you're going to lead this off. So, I'll turn it over to you. That's right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so as you all know, we have received the National Dislocated Worker Grant to help support our recovery from COVID-19. Um, as Dr. Walker said, our good news since the last time we met is that we were awarded our full our full ask of $25 million. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go over a little bit of what the state has done um, so far where we're at as a state in terms of unemployment. And then I'm going to kick it off to, to Lisa Lambert and to Carol Pofer. Um, Northwest Georgia and Northeast Georgia because they can tell you better than I can of how the work is going um, on the ground and how they're um, working really hard and their staffs are working really hard to serve participants. So just to kind of give you an idea of where our unemployment claims are in the state of Georgia right now. Um, so the last number you all saw for me was the July number, the 450,000. So we have seen a significant decrease in the number of initial claims that we're getting um, each month. So in August, we dipped all the way down to 178, and now we're seeing a, a slow trickle upwards. Um, and that is kind of a result of the trend I mentioned in August, which is that um, the layoffs that we saw that were temporary are now becoming permanent or they're extending. And so that's kind of contributing to some of the uptick that we're seeing here. Um, but overall, we are seeing a decrease. So that's um, good news, of course. In the month of October, our state reported an unemployment rate of 4.5%, and that was down 1.8% from the previous month. So things are improving. They're, they're not um, back to normal as we would call normal but um we are improving i guess in february the unemployment was um, unemployment rate was 3.1 and that was our all-time low so at 4.5 i think we're we're sitting pretty good um I, I do want to just caution you all in thinking about that number the unemployment rate does not account for folks who are not actively seeking work and so there is a chance that's a little bit undercounted just if folks have become discouraged enough or because of safety reasons have chosen to opt out of um, being an active member of um, the workforce at this time so you can keep going Nia. thank you so as i said we've got our full award of 25 million dollars um, and our full award, our kind of performance measures that we're looking to hit, we're looking to serve about 1,070 participants on the disaster employment side. So those are temporary opportunities um, that allow participants to um, receive, a, excuse me, work for pay for either humanitarian, humanitarian assistance or cleanup, and then career and training services participants. Um, we're looking to serve about 1,400. And I just wanted to, to highlight here just the importance of employer engagement with this. You know, we are looking to upskill and reemploy these individuals, um, but the way to do that is to have a good pulse of, of what's going to be in demand on the horizon. And so we want to make sure that we are training our participants to be more competitive in the workplace if they are going into these types of opportunities. Um, all of our 19 LWDAs are serving as project operators, either on the disaster employment side or the career and training services side or a combination of the two. And then we've got some state agency partnerships with both the Georgia Department of Labor and the Georgia Department of Education to um, get all of these folks served. So as I said, um, no one can tell you better how this work is going than our local area director. So I'm going to pass it on to Lisa Lambert, our director for Northwest Georgia, um, to share a little bit about um, what she's experiencing in her area. Thank you. Thanks. And Lisa, I'm sorry I called you Leslie. It's, it is Lisa. It's Thank you very much. No problem. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. And um, I thank Brittany for this opportunity to present to the board our um, National Disaster Dislocated Worker Grant. 
to begin with, um, we started working back in March trying to put and implement this grant. And our grant consists of two components. We have a um, disaster relief temporary employment part component, and we have a uh, employment and training component. And of course, for anyone to be eligible for this grant, they have to meet what we consider to be the definition of a dislocated worker, which means they have to be temporary or permanently impacted by uh, COVID-19 and also meet other definition or criteria uh, for a dislocated worker. Currently, our number here, numbers here in WorkSource North, Northwest Georgia consists of 21 out of 50 disaster relief temporary employment slots that we have filled and 31 out of 70 employment and training slots. Next slide, please. Okay, um, when we first got notification of this grant, you know, we had to plan, you know, strategize and come up with how we're going to reach individuals. We was in the midst of pandemic, we was closed down. Every agency was closed down. We was working remotely from home. So the first thing that we did is that we reached out to our community partners. We reached out to our local schools in which they happened to be closed, but we reached out to the administrators, those of authority. We reached out to some of our colleges within our 15 county area areas, as well as counties and municipalities. We figured that if anyone needed help, they would be more in need of help during this um, pandemic time. And the main purpose was to try to engage as many employers as possible, because most importantly, we needed work site for the temporary employment component. So we reached out to community partners. We began to hold virtual meetings with our staff, contractors, providers, um, to train and discuss the components and the criteria of the grant because we want to make sure that we was able to implement this grant as quickly as possible and as uh, appropriately. We want to make sure that we're being good stewards of the funds that have been awarded to us. Also, in addition, we decided to update our organization network and infrastructure. And what we did is that we created a virtual online participant portal and in this participant portal, there was a um, portal directly for COVID applications. So um, it allowed individuals to go online, to apply for our COVID grant online, complete all necessary forms and documentation and submit those to the staff here. Not only did this um, update of our uh, infrastructure network help with our COVID um, uh, grant, it also increased the availability of application for our regular programs, our adult program, our dislocated worker program, as well as our youth program. So uh, we have gotten numerous applications through this portal. We have even received applications outside our region, outside our 15 county area. So, and we was able to get those um, applications to their appropriate um, agency. So, and also another thing that we did that was very instrumental is that we hired a regional staff person. Um, Northwest Georgia is composed of 15 counties. And we're here in Rome, Georgia right now, but in order to provide services to our Northern County, it's like a two hour drive. So we decided to hire a regional staff person to work within those Northern counties where we would not be um, as, able to uh, drive on a daily basis too. So we hired a temporary staff person and her major responsibilities were to coordinate and recruit potential uh, participants. And that's definitely one thing that worked well for us. I think most of the individuals that we have in our temporary employment program is from the North, are from the Northern counties here in Northwest Georgia. So that was a major um, planning and a major strategy that we used to um, that helped our uh, employment training. Another strategy that I would like to talk about is that we, we continue to meet weekly with our staff. We have weekly meetings. We discuss any type of shortfalls, any problems. We, um, we, have, we discuss enrollments. Are everyone being enrolled timely? Are they receiving case notes? Uh, you know, are the work sites working? Have we dropped anybody from work sites? So, we continue to meet weekly as staff, also with our contractors. And one thing that um, 
um, that this pandemic has caused all of us to do is to pivot and just embrace this pandemic for what it is. We have totally had to restructure how we do things. We are not seeing people, we really don't provide direct services here, but we are not able to see face to face. So my contractors and providers have that opportunity. We contract with Georgia Northwestern Tech and they are seeing participants face to face. But um, one thing when we invented or developed our network infrastructure that enabled us to continue to do business and conduct business without having to um, meet and greet or see individuals face to face. And I think they felt individuals or participants feel more comfortable that way. And I know staff did. Next slide. Here, um, this is just an example of some of our temporary employment opportunities. Uh, we work with the um, Office of Workforce Development and outlining some job positions for our temporary um, work experience program. We have prevention monitor, outreach worker, food storage and distribution worker, sanitation monitor, as well as a COVID cleaner. And um, those 21 individuals fit within these uh, positions and opportunities. Next slide. Also, I just want to give the um, board opportunity to look at some of our occupational training. These are um, um, some of the programs that our COVID-19 or disaster participants are enrolled in at our local technical colleges. As you can see, most of them consist of the medical field. However, we do have uh, commercial truck driving. We have some individuals um, that uh, meet the criteria of dislocated worker that is involved in uh, commercial truck driving training. Next slide. Here, anytime you have a new grant that you have, have to implement, there are challenges. And we have had some challenges, but we are working through them. We have worked through them and we will continue to work through them. One thing, as I mentioned before, our participant recruitment, it was almost impossible to recruit. Um, no one was working. The state was still shut down. We was all working remotely at one point in time. So it was actually hard to recruit participants for this grant. Um, one thing that did help, as I stated before, is the, was the development of our virtual online participant portal. And that helped tremendously. Uh, so we was able to start getting applications through there and also the hiring of a temporary staff person did make a difference with our recruitment. Again, um, onboarding, it was hard because even though we had a means to receive applications virtually, the ongoing, onboarding process was difficult because we receive applications for everybody. <laughs> and, and, and some of the individuals simply did not meet the uh, criteria for a dislocated worker. So onboarding was a challenge for us uh, in the beginning. Of course, looking at work sites, it was hard with um, the country shut down to secure work sites or even develop work sites. And so many of our public employers were closed, still closed, or they wasn't open directly to the public. So, um, and this continued to be a challenge for us even today, trying to make sure that we can find work sites that meet the criteria of the grant and also based upon the positions that we can place individuals in. One thing that made a tremendous difference as far as a challenge is that we felt like we was competing with the Pandemic Unemployment Act, the PUA claims. This is the uh, unemployment claims where individuals that were dislocated received an extra $600 a week. So at some point in time during this time, we weren't able to find anyone to go to work because everyone that received unemployment were receiving this additional, these additional funds and they weren't interested in going to work. So this is probably our major challenge here was trying to overcome this and find individuals. Um, during this time, we reached out and we was able to uh, find uh, long-term individuals. That's mean individuals that had been out of work for 27 weeks or longer so we was able to work that aspect of the grant and find individuals to enroll into our program. Another challenge is a natural disaster versus a pandemic. As we know, a pandemic is totally different than a natural disaster. We're still going through it. 
and we'll continue to go through it. So this alone has been, uh, will continue to be a challenge and, and we will do the best we can to work through it. Uh, implementation of the grant during the shutdown, it was extremely hard. As I said before, everything was closed. We, uh, we did the best we could uh, under the circumstances. We received guidance from TCSG, Office of Workforce Development. We had everything, the tables was quite helpful, but it was just difficult, you know, and it proposed a challenge for our local area, as I'm sure it did for others, to try to implement a grant when the state or the economy is closed completely. Um, one thing that I do want to say is that um, even though with all these challenges, we have been successful and I feel like that we will fill all of our uh, temporary work experience slots as well as our employment and training slots. We have about 68 more to go, if I'm not mistaken. And I feel certain that um, by February, hopefully we will have all of those filled to capacity. The most important thing is we have been told what the Office of Workforce Development is that we do need to try to spend money as quickly as possible. And that's one thing that we have tried to do. I think as of the uh, September FSR, we had spent approximately maybe $75,000. And that was as of the end of September. So I know that we have went over that $100,000 mark by now because we do have individuals that are working we're starting to get tuition costs in, which will be directly charged to that grant. So I feel like that we will be able to spend our money and we will be able to secure our slots. Next slide, please. Um, if you would like to receive additional information about WorkSource Northwest Georgia, we have a Facebook page. We welcome you to uh, please go on there and just take a look at it. Also, our website, www.careerdepot.org. Um, if you would like to learn or receive additional information about WorkSource Northwest Georgia, um, we're very proud of our work site. It's not perfect, but it is a work in progress. We're having to pivot and change all the time. So it will continue to be a change in mechanism that we hope that will work for Northwest Georgia. Um, I think that's just about everything I have. Any questions or comments? Anyone? I'd be glad to answer those. Okay, if not, I just appreciate the opportunity, Brittany. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to um, present to the State Workforce Board. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. And I'm happy to be here, Carol Rayburn Kofer. And uh, we can skip the first couple of slides there since uh, what the overall uh, aspect of the project kind of is the same uh, from the state level. And I do want to point out on this particular slide, um, this is a federal disaster grant. And as um, Lisa said, uh, there's a little difference between a pandemic and a disaster. And uh, we've had other parts of our state that have experienced disaster in the past, and we've had other local workforce areas uh, that have also participated in disaster grants. And because of that, uh, there were some of us that were a little apprehensive about this particular grant because we'd heard a few stories that we weren't sure how this might play out. But I think what we've all experienced is this particular disaster as a pandemic is very different. And to use one of Lisa's phrases, we have been pivoting throughout this. Again, it is a U.S. Department of Labor grant, um, and it was very specific about how that grant could be used, both uh, from the standpoint of a humanitarian disaster efforts in the work experience, and that these uh, humanitarian disaster efforts needed to be uh, related to COVID and assisting our public and nonprofit organizations in their efforts to continue to deliver services uh, with the extraordinary uh, requirements uh, in trying to combat any COVID related um, issues. And then secondly is the funding for training for dislocated workers to become permanently employed. 
And in all honesty, that's what our local area was looking for, are those funds that would let us be able to provide uh, the individual training account training to the dislocated workers uh, that we saw we would have a need for or projected we would have a need for. Uh, and next slide, please. Our first activity that we focused on was uh, recruiting potential work sites uh, for the disaster work experience because this was the first pot of money that we had uh, our access to. And uh, we did uh, uh, work through the process of the fact that the work that these work sites would be doing and the work that the participants, work experience participants would be involved in would need to be related to the extraordinarily effort of COVID related, not regular activities. Some of the entities that we have reached out to so far, um, uh, and I'm gonna get to the actual work sites we have on the next slide, but we have also been recruiting with our athens Clark County Central Services Department, the athens Clark County Library, as the libraries have reopened. This has provided another opportunity for us to uh, be an option of assisting them in sanitization. We've had a long conversation actually since April and May with our Athens Community Council on Aging about their food distribution program. And Athens Clark County, uh, the C Council on Aging became the entity that was distributing food directly to all citizens, not just to the uh, senior adults that had been part of their regular services. We've also uh, had a conversation with our local Georgia Department of Labor uh, even though they are closed to the public at this time, uh, they have had a uh, couple of their offices in our region that have been open with staff and that does create uh, some opportunities for ongoing sanitization for them. We've also reached out to the Regional Education Services Agency in our re region, RESA, uh, Northeast Georgia RESA, uh, uh, sending information to them about the potential for us to be able to assist our local school districts and we're following up on individual contacts with those local school districts as well. Next slide, please. Our current work sites, uh, and we did get off to a fairly slow, um, if you wanna call it uh, uptick. Uh, we made contact in April and May, uh, but in all honesty, we did not get our work sites operational till late July, early August. Um, the reason being that some of the entities that we had initial conversations with they had a much slower opening. In particular with our food bank of Northeast Georgia, um, when I first contacted them in uh, April and May, they were very fortunate to have a contingent from the National Guard that was there to assist them in their food distribution. Um, and so they weren't in a position that they actually needed the additional uh, work source, workforce at that time. As that contingent's uh, assignment what appeared to be waning down in July, uh, Chuck Tony, uh, uh, their executive director, recontacted me and said, we're ready. And so we worked through their process. The Classic Center is doing everything on the earth to try to get that facility reopened so that they are able to be a part of the economic engine uh, within the Athens area. Uh, hospitality is a big uh, in interaction in our region and the Classic Center is engaged in that with a number of meetings and uh, conferences. Uh, many of which had to figure out different ways to deliver. Uh, but uh, the, the way that we really got our first group of uh, potential workers is I was on a Convention Business Bureau Advisory Committee meeting in April, and they were talking about what the concerns were and what efforts they had underway uh, to um, deal with that. And as part of that meeting, it, it was made um, public that the Classic Center had actually laid off uh, over 120 employees because we were very concerned about where we were going to find these dislocated workers if we did get work sites. And so I reached out to the Classic Center both about them serving as a work site, but also what uh, information they had about those employees that had been impacted by the layoff. And through that, we were able to identify some of uh, the folks that either been uh, employees at the Classic Center or had been self-employed uh, contractors to the Classic Center. And that was our first pool of participants to actually refer over to the Food Bank of Northeast Georgia. So it's all about uh, figuring out those connections and how to make those work together. So we rocked along initially with the Classic Center and the Food Bank of Northeast Georgia. Uh, as our first two, we wanted to use them as a pilot. They were local for us so we could work out any kinks. And we got a very good uh, process worked out as far as uh, how we would work through 
everything there. Uh, we currently have in, uh, in the works our uh, Wimberley Center, which is a community center that has 11 partners over in Barra County. Uh, and they're looking at both, even though our slide says food distribution, they're also looking at sanitization as one of their activities there. Um, and then just recently, uh, because this is something that we started, as you've heard me say, in April and May, but this is an ongoing constant reach out uh, interaction. Uh, we had a presentation uh, the first of this month to all of our senior centers in our region, all 12. And from that, we've had reach out from at least three of those that have expressed an interest uh, just this week. And so we, can, we see that as a continuing and, and will continue to evolve from there. Next slide, please. Um, in recruiting potential workers, uh, I've already mentioned the a Convention Visitors Bureau uh, advisory meeting where we did uh, recruit some from uh, the companies that had experienced layoffs as well as other companies. We've also had a reach out to the Department of Labor, our local offices, and asked them, uh, provided them with the information on the right-hand side of the screen and some other information similar to that for them to share with uh, persons that they have uh, interaction with via the phone or via uh, the internet to share with them uh, this opportunity, both from the standpoint of the disaster work experience opportunity or the, uh, the piece with the um, uh, training piece. Um, and then it is something that we are working on uh, looking for people that are enrolling in that uh, tr occupational skills training. They can also be enrolled in the work experience activity and participate in both. Some may do the work experience first and then do the occupational skills training and some schedule may allow them to do both. We too have used social media extensively. Uh, we have a very robust uh, Facebook presence and, and have for quite some time. And so we have shared the information about this opportunity on our Facebook page. Um, and uh, also LinkedIn as well, we have that presence also. Um, we have shared the flyer and information with a multitude of community partners, some of which I've already mentioned, but we also have shared that with our uh, Department of Family and Children's Services and our community-based organizations, letting them know that this opportunity is available both from a work site standpoint for recruitment, but also for potential workers. For us, outside of the Food Bank of Northeast Georgia, um, the best recruitment tool we've had has been when a potential work site says to us, we are interested in being a work site, we immediately say, do you have someone that may be volunteering for, for you that might meet the eligibility criteria for a dislocated worker? And we've had that be the case, so then we're able to go through the process there. Uh, because recruitment of the potential workers is probably going to be our biggest concern particularly in trying to serve all 12 counties. And so we definitely are reaching out to the potential work site to see if they know of anyone in their community that they're aware of that they can make a referral to for us or someone that perhaps has volunteered with them that could be look, uh, reviewed to see if they meet the criteria of a dislocated worker. And we, did, we do have that uh, in some cases. Next slide, please. Um, we too have pivoted on the whole issue of how we take applications and do our paperwork. Um, we are very much uh, uh, an in-person uh, operation up until now, but in March we did a very quick pivot uh, even before this grant was funded and we converted to 100% uh, on the telephone. It's our belief that um, we have a lot of people that have very a lot of challenges with technology in our region for a multitude of reasons. Some is just the broad demand access and internet connectivity. Others is the lack of familiarity with that. And so uh, we've had a long presence of our first contact being with customers uh, over the telephone. And so we just converted our application process to also be over the phone. Uh, we schedule a time to meet with them uh, over the phone. We take all the information, fill out the application. We send it to them in a self-addressed stamped envelope uh, included, and then they return it back to us. This entire process has probably taken somewhere between two and a half to three weeks, which is a pretty quick turnaround time considering the mail in there. And we've not had any issues with the mail. Uh, and then once they are approved, the work experience participants are then connected with the potential work site. The work site is also doing a virtual uh, interview with them, but then uh, they are making arrangements of when their start date will be. And um, right now we're at, because of where the locations of our 
two main work sites, the ones in Athens, we are actually uh, able to have a physical check-in with them, uh, socially distanced, of course, with masks on, uh, and uh, have worked through any issues. Uh, we've actually had some of those participants at the food bank that have already gotten uh, full-time unsubsidized jobs, and we're excited for them on that opportunity. And so they're moving on to the next stage, and we're continuing to recruit through that. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, and our numbers aren't as high as uh, Northwest Georgia yet uh, because we uh, are letting it happen as it happens based on the contacts that we have out there, particularly because we did want to really try to work out any kinks. So we have two work sites with participants uh, that we have a total of nine with 11 in process and those are actually starting this next week. Uh, we currently have 12 that are enrolled in training with four additional ones that are in process and we're continuing to actively recruit. Part of the disadvantage for us in the training side is for the last year, we've had a waiting list in place uh, with our adult population and for a fair significant portion for our youth population. And, and, and very fortunately in our region, we did not have very many dislocated workers at all. We had probably had about 20 total that were enrolled this past year. So what we're uh, overcoming is the awareness that uh, we didn't have any money to the awareness that we do have money. And so we have been reaching out to all of our different training vendors, uh, including the technical colleges that provide uh, training. Uh, and we've reached out to them to let them know that yes, we do have dollars available to serve persons that meet the criteria of dislocated worker. Um, and sometimes that's a bit of a challenge for us because it's not necessarily that they were COVID impacted, it's the fact that they meet the WI, they can also meet the definition of the WIOA uh, dislocation. And so it's just a matter of sharing that information and we've been working on that. And we anticipate that these numbers will increase again with the January enrollment at the technical colleges. But in addition to our technical colleges, we also have uh, for-profit, not-for-profit uh, vendors that are on the state eligible training provider list that we work with. Um, a pro predominant training that we've been involved in uh, with uh, our dislocated workers has been the CDL training and also welding training. Uh, and so those are two short-term training programs that we have available in our region. Um, as uh, Lisa had said, this has been a pivot. Uh, and uh, at moments and times, it's been a little frustrating, but at the same time, it's been that challenge and everybody that knows me knows that I love a little challenge. Uh, I, I do much better when I feel like we're uh, b being uh, asked to think about ways to do different things in different ways. And so um, we're excited about the opportunity to have access to these dollars and to help the people within our regions uh, connect to resources that will help them uh, weather this pandemic and uh, are optimistic that we will uh, increase our numbers. We've got strategies in place and continuing to work on that and are excited to see what great things can come out of uh, the opportunities for our citizens to weather the pandemic and come out to the other side and uh, look to see the bright horizon in the next future. And appreciate the opportunity to be able to present to y'all today. Thank you. Most excellent. Um, Brittany, uh, Lisa, and Carol, thank y'all very much. Questions? Well, I appreciate the, the hard work um, in this space and the continued focus on um, making sure that uh, we're continuing to figure out ways to serve, pivoting, uh, whatever the terms we use. Uh, and uh, Carol, I laughed when you said you like a challenge. Um, and Because uh, uh, for all those who don't know Carol that well, yes, she does. And she likes to challenge folks um, with opportunities, which is great, which is why I love what we do. So folks, thank you all very much. And uh, great, great update. All right, uh, I think we're moving to the, uh, the last item on the agenda before adjournment, um, Stephen. Uh, but we're going to cover the uh, PY19 performance results. So Stephen, I'm going to turn it over to you, sir. All right, sounds good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, like uh, Mr. Chairman said, I'm covering the PY19 performance uh, report. I think I'm standing between you guys and uh, not only lunch, but a holiday weekend week. Uh, so I'm trying to be as brief as possible. 
Uh, and Dr. Wilburn already hit the highlights in his report out. So um, between the, uh, the the nice beard that you've grown and your your concise yet uh, informative report outs, I think I'm going to turn this over to you from now on, uh, Dr. Wilburn. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to do a quick uh, catch up on, on the wonkiness of uh, WIOA performance. Uh, it's not quite straightforward, so I'll walk you through how we're measured, uh, get into the actual uh, performance results, and then talk a little bit about our, our PY19 uh, participant characteristics and uh, program overall, and then get you all out of here. Next slide. <clears throat> So the feds measure us uh, in, in PY19 based on the following measures for adults and dislocated workers. Uh, they looked at our participants uh, in the second quarter after they left our program and the fourth quarter after they left our program and asked if they, got, if, if they had a job or not. Uh, and that constitutes our uh, interim employment rate for, for those two quarters. Uh, they also look at if the participants went through a training or education program, if they obtained a recognized credential as a result of that program. Um, and that's, you know, there's a rate uh, associated with that. And then uh, of those folks who were employed in that second quarter after they left, what were the median earnings of that exit cohort? And youth are measured uh, in PO 18 in a similar manner. Uh, the only difference is that Q2 and Q4 employment rate also looks at if they entered post-secondary education or training uh, after they left the program. Uh, next slide. Uh, I mentioned those were that's how we were graded in PY19 because uh, this coming or this program year we're in now PY20. Uh, the feds are adding uh, some additional measures that we're graded on uh, measurable skills gains, which is also tied to any participants that are in training or, or education. Uh, but instead of being an end of uh, program uh, measure, it's while they're in the, inside of the program. So moving or progressing through that education or training program, uh, making sure they hit any benchmarks that are associated with that training. And additionally, the youth are going to be measured uh, for any of the interim employment on the median earnings uh, of those participants who uh, obtain employment. Um, and those are being, uh, we've negotiated rates with, with ETA on those goals. Uh, we've added effectiveness in serving employers. We, we did not negotiate rates with the feds on those just yet, but we are going to pay a little more close attention to the employer measures. And what those are, are uh, for any of our participants who are placed with an employer in that second quarter, are they with the same employer in that fourth quarter or not? Uh, and additionally, we're also measured on any employers that receive uh, services from our workforce system. Uh, do they re receive an additional service in the subsequent three year period? And uh, like I said, PY19 was the last year where there are no performance-based sanctions, so all the, the excellent performance that I'm about to uh, share with you uh, isn't, you know, it, it didn't quote unquote count. Uh, this year, moving forward, uh, we're, we're dealing with live rounds, so any kind of shortcomings that we have will uh, uh, face any sanctions, but I, I don't foresee that being an issue. Next slide. Uh, like I said, Dr. Wilburn kind of hit on the highlights of, of the following slides, uh, but just to kind of help you navigate uh, we, the, the first column is the indicator, uh, the, the performance measure that ETA grades us on. Uh, the actual column is what we actually obtained for POI-19. Negotiated goal is the goal that uh, we set with uh, ETA. And that percent of goal is, you know, as, it, as it sounds, the percent of the goal that we obtained. Now, the way that the feds actually grade us, uh, there's two ways. For any individual measure, as long as we're within 50% of our negotiated goal, we're okay, uh, which sounds pretty, uh, more than reasonable. But they also add in, uh, across all the measures, they average that percent of the goal, uh, and we need to be within 90% of uh, our, our goal. So if you look and, and average out all of our percent of goals in that right-hand column, uh, you'll see that for our adult program, uh, we obtained 138.8% of our goal, which is well above that 90% average. Uh, the thing that really helped us was that credential attainment uh, goal compared to where we actually uh, performed. Uh, PY 20 and 21, that goal ticks up a little bit. That was a new measure when we were doing negotiations with ETA in 18 and 19. Uh, so the feds gave us a lot of latitude there. We uh, we still have a good bit of latitude in 20 and 21 coming up, uh, but it won't be nearly uh, that low. Uh, but overall, like I said, very strong performance uh, for PY19. Move to the next slide. 
for dislocated workers, uh, kind of a similar story. Uh, we exceeded every every goal uh, quite a bit. Uh, overall, we were at 130.4 percent of our goal. Uh, the median earnings is what really uh, held up that average uh, for dislocated workers. We had a, a, a lot of strong programs uh, helping our dislocated workers find employment and some high paying jobs. Moving to the next slide. And then our youth program, uh, our, we exceeded our, our overall performance 116.7% uh, overall. Uh, I think Dr. Wilbur hinted at this, but I was excited. Uh, since we moved to WIOA, we've never been with over 90% of our goal for that credential attainment. Uh, it was a challenging uh, goal and it's a little wonky. Uh, you know, with WIOA, until we got that waiver, most of our youth participants had to be out of school. So that means they had to obtain a, a GED or high school equivalency. And in addition for that high school equivalency or high school diploma to count as a uh, for credential attainment, that youth needed to also go into post-secondary education or into employment. Um, it's not just getting the credential for it to be a positive. They had to, to go above and beyond in enter post-secondary education or employment. So that was a little bit of a challenge, uh, but our, our local areas uh, exceeded uh, or, or lived up to that challenge and we're at 92.7% uh, of our goal, which like I said, the first time in five, four or five years of WIOA that we've exceeded that 90%. So. Uh, and like I said, I say we, uh, the state doesn't actually serve any participants on its own you know, out of our office. Uh, it's all of our local areas, hard work, um, folks like Carol and Lisa and, and the rest. Uh, so kudos to them. You know, next slide. Uh, this is just kind of comparing year over year. Uh, for the most part, we did better than last year, uh, almost across the board. Uh, slight uh, decreases in the dislocated worker employment rates. That, that uh, is mostly due to uh, smaller numbers of dislocated workers. PY19 was uh, back, most of the performance outcomes were during the, uh, when, when the economy was doing well. So we didn't have as many dislocated workers to, to, to work with. Uh, so any kind of changes are accentuated uh, in those rates. And then there was a little bit of a drop in the adult median earnings. Uh, but dislocated worker median earnings increased uh, and then you can see at the bottom that 4% increase in youth, youth credential rate uh, was, our, was a, a big jump. You can go to the next slide. All right, so enough of the, just uh, the uh, performance, uh, the, the, the wonky federal performance, I'll give you a little bit more information on what actually happened in PY19. Um, the, the top section is, is kind of the demographics of our participants. Uh, but I want to focus on the, the bottom part, the participant flows. So that 19,294 folks, that's how many folks we served in PY19. That was down about 1,500 uh, participants uh, from PY18. And you'll know that the, the second half of PY19 was uh, impacted by, by COVID. Uh, and so that, that explains a good bit of that, that decrease. Uh, for, for reference, we enrolled only 681 folks in that March 15th to June 30th period uh, of, of PY19. And the six months leading up to COVID, uh, we enrolled 2,467 participants, and that was when the economy was booming. Uh, and so you can see the, the uncertainty and the uh, the impacts to our our uh, you know, service delivery and then of our, our providers, and, and impacted our ability to, to enroll folks in that early period of COVID. But now, since coming out in PY20, uh, we've enrolled 1,764 folks just in the last three four months. Uh, so we're almost back to pre-COVID enrollments uh, moving forward. So that's some good news on that. Uh, we, we carried uh, 1,300 folks in to PY19, um, but we're only carrying 12,782 uh, into PY20. So um, we're, you know, that just gives you a little idea of, of uh, our, our participant flows. Go to the next slide. So this is, uh, the map on the left is our total participants by county. Uh, other than DeKalb kind of being the number one uh, county for participants, it basically tracks with a, a population uh, density map. Uh, so I wanted a, another way to kind of look at uh, our participants and, and where they live and, and you know, how we're, if we're reaching out to them. The map on the right is the percent of the county's population that is a WIOA participant. And you'll see, 
uh, if, if you know your Georgia geography and, and demographics, Tolliver County is our, our least populous county, so you may be thinking, no, this is just an inverse population density map. Uh, but really, if you look at the other kind of dark green, that's Terrell County. Um, it's not uh, it's not an overly populous county, but it's not one of the smaller ones either. Um, and it works out uh, out of the 8,600 or so uh, residents, about 70. Uh, are, are we our participants, which is the highest uh, kind of percentage of uh, population. And they were, it turns out they have some, some good partnerships with their uh, Board of Education uh, there. So that shows you that uh, reaching out to the more even rural areas, uh, having some uh, agreements and, and, and relationships uh, really has major impacts, especially in our rural areas, in helping folks who need it. You go to the next slide. I also want to say if anybody's a country music fan, Cole Swindell uh, is from Terrell County, and he's also a George Southern Eagle, so I want to give a shout out for that. Uh, so this slide shows uh, the customer characteristics of any of our participants who had uh, what I call challenges to employment. The federal terminology is barriers to employment. Uh, I don't like the word barriers to employment, um, so I, I use challenges. Uh, other than being low income, which is our, our biggest challenge to employment, um, of 16,000 or so of our participants are low income, which would make this graph kind of lopsided. Uh, our other barrier, our, our largest barrier is basic skills deficiency. So uh, 5,050 of our participants from PY19 had a, uh, were basic skills deficient, basically meaning that they had uh, challenges reading or doing math above the eighth grade level. And that's about 25% you know, or so of our participants uh, are at that basic skills deficient level, uh, which when you look at our, our performance and, and being able to place 86, 87% of our, our participants into employment, we're over, our, our local areas and our providers are, are doing a great job overcoming those challenges to employment and getting our participants uh, prepared to work. You can go to the next slide. Um, so I wanted to highlight kind of the, the industries that we're placing our participants in and the occupations that our participants uh, are, are most likely to enter. Um, while our number one individual occupation is uh, truck driving, uh, our number one kind of occupational group or, or industry that we place folks in is, is the healthcare industry. Uh, our number our two occupation is registered nurses, we've got nursing assistants, LPNs, medical assistants and, and dental hygienists all kind of go in that healthcare realm. Um, and then, like, so like I said, even though truck driving is our number one individual occupation, we're, we put a lot of folks in, in the healthcare industry. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, this slide highlights the kind of before and after participation. So uh, before someone enters WIOA, on average, they're earning uh, about $3,800 a quarter, uh, about you know, $14,000 $14, a year. Uh, and then after they go through our program, uh, if they received an ITA, which is the blue line, uh, an ITA is a training account. They went through some sort of training program. Uh, they are a little over $8,000 a quarter or yeah, $32,000 a year. So you can see the, the drastic uh, difference in uh, wage opportunity of, of our participants before and after uh, participation. Go to the next slide. And then this, uh, y'all may remember this slide from last year, updated with our PY19 folks. Um, so what we did here is we looked at all the earnings of our PY19 folks who were employed uh, and, and added up the earnings uh, of those participants. That worked out to 169 million, uh, a little over 169 million dollars. Uh, for PY19, our allocation from the feds was a little over $78 million. So we kind of had a net return of $91 million. Or another way to look at it is for every dollar that uh, the feds uh, invested, uh, we had a $2.17 return. And this is just on the, the wages of the employees or of the participants. <clears throat> it doesn't take into account any uh, you know, of our, our local area salaries, staff salaries, training providers, uh, the, the money that trickles through uh, our training providers. Um, and to kind of get a better idea of what that number is, we are uh, putting together a, an economic impact study um, that'll kind of evaluate what those multiplier effects are for our, uh, our 
our programs. Uh, so we're looking to have that finished. Hopefully uh, we'll have the final report for you guys before the May board meeting. Um, so be on the lookout for that. And I think that's it. So if you have any questions, let me know. Well, Stephen, thanks a lot. We really appreciate you going over the information. And folks, what we'll end up doing is sending these this information out to everyone so you have a copy of uh, what was covered today. Great reports, great presentations. I'm very thankful for the hard work. And as you saw in the numbers, um, as you saw in just the, the energy and enthusiasm of the entire team, um, just kudos to everybody for doing a, for a job well done. And I definitely look forward to facing the challenges and opportunities as we move forward into 21. So great job. Um, folks, I know we're close to, to the end of our meeting. And um, I do want to uh, just take a, a point of privilege here for just a minute um, and just share with you that um, uh, just talk about Joe Dan Banker for a second. I know he's on. Um, uh, basically, I just hear, so let me just go ahead and do it. You know, it's with mixed emotions that I announced to you all the retirement of our very own Joe Dan, Joe Dan Banker. Uh, Joe Dan, I mean, I just, uh, uh, I'll tell you, man, this is, uh, it's hard, you know, while we're, while we're deeply saddened uh, to lose a member of this team, we are extremely proud of your lifetime of service, leadership, and dedication to education and workforce development <clears throat> in Georgia. Uh, you know, Joe Dan has had a long history of service, beginning with his tenure as an officer in the U.S. Navy for more than 20 years. Uh, while in the military, Joe Dan specialized in surface warfare, strategic planning, operations, operations analysis, training and education, curriculum development, education administration. I'm not sure what he didn't do when he was there. Uh, he even earned a master's degree in political science, civil and international affairs from the United States Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, while in the military, Joe Dan also served as a faculty member at the United States Naval War College. And with more than two decades of education and training experience under his belt, Joe Dan retired from the military as a senior officer, moved to Georgia, and served as a senior naval science instructor and commander of the Naval Junior ROTC, ROTC unit at Lee County High School. He would later transition to Albany Technical College, holding positions of Director of Continuing Education and Business and Industry Services, the Dean of Academic Affairs, Vice President for Academic Affairs. Um, and then following his tenure at uh, Albany Tech, uh, Joe Dan joined the system office of the Technical College System of Georgia to serve as the Executive Director for Academic Affairs. He was later named Assistant Commissioner for Workforce Development, and in July 2019, he since has assumed the additional duties of Deputy Commissioner for Technical Education, Workforce Development, and Secondary Education Initiatives. Aside from being a decorated veteran, a lifetime education advocate, and a statewide leader in the area of workforce development, Joe Dan is most recognized for being a dedicated husband, supportive father, and loving granddad, Papa. Uh, so Joe Dan, you know, we are so proud to have served next to you in this capacity, and we appreciate your leadership and your foresight. I just want to say that you're a man of integrity, um, a man who is a humble servant, and for all of us, a dear friend. Uh, we love you, man, and we're, we're going to miss you. So we're wishing you a, a peaceful and joyous retirement. So now I would say turn it over to Joe Dan, but uh, Joe Dan, before we do that, uh, let's, let's let, allow our leader uh, to say a few words. I'm going to turn it over to Commissioner Dozier, who's uh, over the Technical College System of Georgia. Commissioner? Thank you, Chairman Dallas. And uh, I'll tell you what a great overview of Joe Dan's past uh, history as well as current service. Uh, I couldn't have said it better. Uh, it is such an honor to uh, have had the chance to work with Joe Dan the last 11 months, but even more importantly, uh, as so many have, uh, I'm always an admirer of those who have served our country and have gone before us to make sure that the freedoms that we have are preserved. Uh, Joe Dan and I actually met many years ago um, working with Department of Corrections and trying to make sure that our offenders uh, were receiving a, a quality education, both from a GED 